good to see you. Praise the Lord. Thanks for coming. God's good all the time. And all the time, God is good. So we believe that. Amen. Had a great time Sunday morning. We appreciate the word that was brought by Amy Steele. And uh, appreciate that. Had a great time. It was great anointing in the house. God moved and he's doing a good work. Amen. I believe that. He's doing a good work in all of our lives. He's doing a good work in me. And uh, I know he's bringing new wine. I know he's changing me. And that's not always fun. But it'll all work out in the end and it'll be great. Amen. So uh, praise God. Let me give you, listen, you guys can give, if you want to give tonight, you can give by the boxes in the back as you leave. Just if you want to get your offerings ready, you can do that as you leave and put them in the black boxes. But I do want to go through a couple <coughs> announcements and I don't have all my, I don't have my, um, uh, my, my phone here with me. So anyway, Muffins with Mom uh, this coming uh, weekend. It's Mother's Day weekend, so uh, this could be a great time. So make sure you uh, come on out for that and enjoy some time with your kids. There's baby and child dedication this coming Sunday. Uh, also um, uh, for Mother's Day. Just Desserts, the murder, mystery, and dinner. I'm, I'm excited about this. So I'm certainly, uh, it's, it's going to be great. So anyway, you can kind of, uh, May 19th at 6 p.m. over in uh, the uh, over in the FLC. Uh, you can scan there. We'd like to know, you know, we're going to be taking donations up for the kids with this, but it's $5 per person having spaghetti, right? Buy a spaghetti and then having a murder mystery. So it's going to be good. So... Praise the Lord. Who, who done it, right? It was Mr. Whatever with the candlestick and the whatever. Is that clue or whatever it was? So VBS, sign up to help with VBS. You can use the QR code or visit the welcome desk. So I think that's pretty much it, isn't it? Praise the Lord. All right. Amen. I know they've been working hard. I, it's going to be fun. I'm certainly excited about it, Joe. So it's raining. It's going to be good. Amen. Well, go with me today to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the process of change. The process of change. Um, but I want to start in Luke 5. Luke 5, 37 and 38. The Bible says this, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins and both are preserved. I want to start here because the wine here, there's many types and shadows of, of or actually metaphors of wine in the Bible. But one of the prominent themes of the wine is the Holy Spirit. And ultimately, the Holy Spirit bringing transformation or bringing change. Because wine ferments. Wine ferments. And new wine can't be put into old wineskins. Why? Because old wineskins are actually, um, uh, they become very brittle. They become hard. So what happens is, is an old, old wineskin, it, it can't expand with the fermentation. It, it can't span, expand with the fermentation. So there has to be something, this new wine being placed into to, to new wineskins. Really, actually, it's the renewed skins. And they would actually dip old wineskins into water and that would actually cause it to be able to return its to its elasticity to be able to, to, to handle. So new wine has to be put into renewed skins. Renewed skins. And I started thinking about this today because in Matthew chapter 13, uh, Jesus in these kingdom parables and he said, the kingdom of God is like a man that takes, it's like leaven that a man takes and hides it in three measures of meal until it all is leavened. Yeast, yeast, right, starts the fermentation process. The Holy Spirit, right, is, he starts, he's the agent of the fermentation process. He, he is not going to leave us alone. I know I've been hitting this a lot, but he's not going to leave me alone. He is going to try to change me. 
And so many people right now are frustrated, right? Because why? They are not yielding to the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. People have lost, lost purpose. And when you and I lose purpose, we dull it with pleasures. When, 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 we, when we lose purpose and why, what it is that we're actually called to be and do and all that, we lose that big picture, we start dulling it with pleasures. New wine has to be put into renewed skins. So this is what I wrote down. The issue is, are we willing to go through that transformation process? And we're made for more. So, the, see, this DNA of, of more that's in us, because there's just something that there's, we are made to increase, we are made to move forward. It, this DNA that we have, this spiritual DNA that we have, brings challenges. It requires, the more, the more that I'm talking about requires change. And I'm going to tell you something. God enjoys this process. God enjoys the journey. And he enjoys the process with you. He's a father. He's a gardener. Think about a gardener. A gardener just don't just get satisfaction out of the harvest. The gardener gets satisfaction out of working the ground. The gardener gets satisfaction of, of tending to it. A father, listen, think, think about it. That's why your kids aren't just given to you. Can you guys turn me down a little bit? I'm, I'm echoing or something here. Um, the farmer, the farmer, he enjoys that. A father enjoys raising his kids. Amen. That's why you're not giving your children. That's why you're not just giving them as adults. Why? There's a process and there's something to be enjoyable about raising our children. We can mold and we can shape them. See, God gets great joy out of shaping us. God gets great joy of, of the process and the journey. He's not frustrated at you. He loves you and he wants you, but he's, he's calling us to change. But the current structures, I think I wrote this down. Uh, let me find it. Um, we are the wineskin. So an, let me read this. An old mindset or an old structure, when we try to put something new into an old structure or an old mindset, things that were meant to be a blessing to us to actually change us will not. So the gifts or the people around you or a sermon that will come forth, right? Or whatever. The thing that was caused to be a blessing, if it's in an old structure or an old mindset, what will happen is it will actually burst and be spilt and be wasted. I'm making sense to you guys. What happens is the spirit is quenched. Things that were meant to change us, to bring us into greater joy, to bring us into growth, to bring us into a blessing, it's wasted. It's wasted. It spills out. Why? Because we're not willing to be renewed. You say, well, how do I? You, gotta, you and I just need to stay pliable. We need to stay humble. We need to stay teachable. We need to, we need, these are the things that keeps us pliable. We need to continue to be dipped in, in the word, in the presence of the Lord, enjoying God's presence, enjoying this journey. And what happens is, we listen, that wineskin begins to expand. And what's been, been given to you to be a blessing is a blessing to you. It's not spilled out. Can I get a good amen here? Are you guys following what I'm saying here? It's a process to change. This fermentation process starts to happen. Amen. Christianity is about change. Well, praise the Lord. Christi Christianity is about change. God wants us to grow. There's one thing that will be constant in our world, and you know what that is? Change. And some people don't like change. Who would be honest today and say, I don't like change? Well, guess what? You're going to be real uncomfortable in Christianity. <laughs> it's funny when I do marriage counseling and do premarital counseling, coaching stuff with people. It's like, you know, you'll have, you know, you'll start talking to them and you have some people that's just resistant to change and some that love change. I always tell them, well, get ready because change is coming. <laughs> right? So listen, I wrote this down. Nowhere in Scripture we're told to grow old in Christ. We're told to grow up in Christ. So we need to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
this will make sense to you as I get here, but go with me to 2 Corinthians. This is, not a, this is not there on the highlighted version of what I gave upstairs, but 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3. Man, I want God to do something great in my life. Right? And he is doing something great in our lives. He's a gardener. He's a father. He enjoys the process. I just need to take his hand, man. I need to let him prune me. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look here in verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There's freedom. There's liberty. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from what? Glory to glory. There's that, there's that increase. There's that more, right? There's that, there's that, that it, more with God. Glory to glory. Faith to faith, right? Now notice, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is to, coming to bring change into my life. That's good. So when so again, he he is the wine, right? He is the leaven. See, leaven, that's what it is. Yeast is the it is the agent of fermentation. It starts the fermentation process. The Holy Spirit is there. He's there to start something in us. He's there to bring the fermentation process into our lives to expand, grow, the spiritual growth. He's the one. He it's by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm, I love that because that means change doesn't depend on me. Change depends on him. I just need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys are right here. So we need to grow up. Now, it's God's will that you be sanctified. Sanctified. It's God's will that you be sanctified. Right? It's God's will. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 3. We won't turn there. It's God's will for you to be sanctified. It's the will of God for you to be more like Jesus. For me to be more like Jesus. We see this same thing in Scripture being repeated. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. May the God of peace sanctify you completely, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this, or be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Be transformed. Metamorpho. Metamorphosis. Right? That change. That lasting change that happens at the core of, very, of, of something. Turns it into something completely different. Amen. Now let me read this at 2 Corinthians 3, 17 uh, through 4, 1 in the New Living Translation real quick. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see, the, re, and, see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more like Him. The Spirit makes us more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. 4.1 Therefore, since God in His mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. So what, what happens is we stop. We stop. We're the ones that put the limits on God. Don't give up. Let him continue to work. Even when you can't see it. Even when you can't feel it. Even when it looks like it's nothing changing. I get it. I understand that. When it looks like it, just don't give up. Continue to let the Spirit of God work. There's a process that's going on on the inside of you. There's a process that's happening. And I got to let that process work. I got to let that process work. So that God's Spirit is in you and there's potential for change. I want you to know that. There's potential for change. Now, let's look here together at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. The Apostle Paul here, and I want to stay in these scriptures for a bit. And he tells us the process of change. And I want you to see it. Because this is how this works. The Holy Spirit's in you right? He's coming to work in you. You guys know that. But I've got to cooperate with him. And this is, how, this is the nuts and bolts of it right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 9 through 11. Now I rejoice. Now let me give you some context. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul was, the book of 1 Corinthians especially was wrote because they had there was questions being asked by the church at Corinth. And they came back to Paul and was asking him these questions. He was answering their questions. 
Well, there was a major problem that was going on in the church. And what was going on was a man, a man was, was committing adultery with his, his, with his stepmom. You can read it. Was, having, was, 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 a, was in an adulterous affair with his stepmother, and, and there was nothing being done about it. So the Apostle Paul comes in and actually throws him out of the church. Pretty strong. Right? So when we start reading here, this is what he's, he wrote, writes him a letter, right? He says, listen, you need to take care of this thing, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 7 here in verse 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to what? I, I need you to get this. this. is where we're going to be at. Your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorrow, sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that, you're, that, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourself. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourself to be clear in this matter. Now there's three things we see here through the process of change from this scripture. Number one is sorrow. Sorrow. Now I want you to get a hold of this. Number one, I want you to understand, pain is an indication that something's wrong in your body. God has actually given you pain for a reason. When you got pain, it's there to say, hey, there's something going on with your ache. Hey, you need to find out what's going on. Right? Pain is an indication that something is wrong. So God has given us a way, right, to know when something is wrong spiritually with our lives, and it's called conviction. Now, I know you know this. The Bible calls it sorrow, godly sorrow, godly sorrow, godly sorrow is initiated by God. If, if Now listen, I'm, I'm roll back to what we first started talking about. If it's God's spirit living in us, right, he's the one that's in me, he's the, he is the new wine, right, he is this thing inside of me that's causing this fermentation process, right, then godly sorrow is actually a gift from God. I need to embrace godly sorrow. This is how change occurs. It, first, it's, it doesn't just start by a changed life. It starts by sorrow. A godly sorrow. The apostle Paul said, I, you were made sorry in, a, so, so, sorry in a godly way. Godly sorrow is initiated by God because he initiates change. So this is a gift from God. Now let me show you this in a practical term in Acts chapter 2. Here, when, when Peter preached, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it's when they heard this, they were what? They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said to them, what? Repent. But you can't repent without being pricked in your heart. Or you being made sorry, a godly sorrow. Now, I think it's interesting because that word cut to the heart, it means to prick, to stab, to sting, or to slice open. Their souls felt an ache. This is how change happens. The Holy Spirit moves in and he starts dealing with our lives. Are you guys all right here? He starts dealing with us. He starts dealing with us about our attitudes. He starts dealing with us about, our, about sin. He starts dealing with us about our lives. And that's a gift. I need to embrace godly sorrow. He said, you were made sorry in a God. You had godly sorrow and you embraced that. You took it to heart. It cut you open. So it's Conviction. Your conscience gets stabbed. It gets sliced open. And all of a sudden, man, you know what you're doing is wrong. Or you know that attitude is wrong. Or, or you know that needs to change in your life. That's a good thing. When people come and tell me, you know what, I've messed up. I say, well, praise God. I'm glad you're here. Right? I'm glad you're here. 
Instead of just shaming people, listen, when people mess up, well, praise God, at least you recognize it. Listen, that means the Spirit of God's working on the inside of you. That's a positive indication that you're saved. I'm not here to take a whip to somebody. What we need to say, well, praise God. Now we know where we need to start. Now we know what needs to, to be fixed. Right? I mean, that's how this rolls. I mean, godly sorrow. Apostle Paul said you were made sorrowly, sorrow, sorrow. You, had, you were sorry in a godly manner. You, you, had, you had godly sorrow and you embraced this godly sorrow. And if you and I want change in our lives, we have to respond to conviction. Now, conviction is different than condemnation, and you guys know that. Conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit where a person is able to see something that needs to change. This will produce inner pain, and that inner pain is like guilt and shame. Now, and I say guilt, it, guilt's a good thing. I need to feel, if I'm doing something wrong, I need to feel guilty. That's not a bad thing. Guilt's a great thing. I need to embrace that. Embracing this. Listen, uh, it, it should, listen, shame, the, the negative shame is where it gets into the place like I'm worthless. But listen, if I sin, it ought to cause me to be shameful. Right? I mean, I, I mean if I'm doing something, it should cause me, well, I mean, I'm, ashamed, I'm ashamed about that. But this is, conviction is, is the tornado siren. Something's wrong. It's, it's the red light on the dashboard. I heard this the other day, and I want to tell you about it. The average person, let me find it right here real quick. The average person will ignore their check engine light for four months before doing something about it. That's the average person. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've drove with a check engine light longer than four months before. Well, it was because I knew something was up and it was a sensor, it was bad or whatever. But that's what we do with our lives. The Holy Spirit is in you to give you an advantage. And one of the ways he gives you an advantage is actually through conviction. That's good. Well, how do you know this is the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, sorrow, right? Sadness or grief... Spiritual, being a sadness or grief, right? How do I know that's, that's a ministry of the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 4.30, grieve not the Holy Spirit. So if I have sorrow or grief or sadness, right? I have conviction. I don't need to turn that off. I need to respond to it. I need to respond. Because I have to realize he loves me. He's a father. He's a gardener. He's coming to bring harvest. He's br coming to bring fruit. So I can, if can, the question is, can I trust him with my life? The question is, can I trust him as that gardener? Can I trust him as that father, right? He knows what he's doing. I'm trying to make this as simple as we can because we need to respond because there's power in repentance. So the pain is God is caused by God dealing with you. We call it dealing with you, right? God dealing with you. He's dealing with me. You ever had God deal with you? Today? <laughs> this week, the past week? I don't know. Have you ever had God deal with you? Now, have, now, let's just, we're all family in here. Who's ever said, no, I ain't doing that? No, God, I ain't responding. Who's ever done that before? Well, praise the Lord. But do we trust him? He's trying to bring new wine. He's trying to break new ground. So in order for that to happen, there's got to be old mindsets and old structures that change. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. How's that going to do? How's that going to happen? By you and I changing. You guys are all right here. Now, if you see back here in 2 Corinthians 7, 
he, he, sees, he says right here in, in verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. There is a remorse that people have. I remember working in the ER at Charleston General, and I can remember being there at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. They'd bring a, you know, somebody that was drunk, and they would come in the door, and man, they would sing Amazing Grace. They'd put them back here in the back of the ER, and they'd be singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And I'm talking about they just, whatever, or Elvis version. I don't know. It was just a bunch of different versions. And they, were, they would sit there and be sappy. You ever, you ever saw people be sappy about their sin? And I'm, right? But they don't ever change. There's a worldly sorrow that will bring remorse. But I don't want remorse. I want repentance. I don't want to just feel bad for my sin. I have to respond. I'll show you that in a second. Let me say this. This quote by Richard uh, Linsky said this. The grief of repentance is never lost in any way. Not to experience this grief, that is loss indeed. So when I get convicted, we're going to call that sorrow. When I feel that and sense that, that is a gift from God. I want to always feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit in my life. Hallelujah. A worldly sorrow. Now, so, first thing is sorrow. Number two is repentance. I got to move. Repentance. So, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians, right? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but... 1 Thessalonians 5 tells me don't quench the Holy Spirit. See, 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 see um, uh, uh, grieving is about character. Quenching is about power. So, so, so this is what we do. See, if I'm not going to grieve the Holy Spirit, the next thing that happens, power shows up. We don't, we don't want to quench him. Which means this, I need to now repent. I need repentance in my life. This is where I want to really get to for the whole night. It's the power of repentance. I want to say this to you guys. Listen, we need to live a repentive life. Repentance is not a dirty word. It's not a word. It is a, it is a biblical word. It, is a, it has a long-standing history. It, it is, it's a word that's throughout the scriptures of a tur- people turning away from sin and turning to God. This is repentance. The Bible, when we think about repentance a lot of times, we just think about it requiring for, being required for salvation. And that is truly, that's where it starts. But for the believer, for you and I, it's important for our transformation into Christ's likeness is for you and I to embrace repentance. It, to embrace repentance. It's one of the most important words of the Bible. Romans 2, 4 says, it's the goodness of God that leads us to Repentance. It's God's goodness that I get sorrow of heart. It's God's goodness that I get convicted. It's God's goodness that actually leads me now to repent. The goodness of God produces the sorrow that leads me to repent. It's God's goodness. I like the message Bible here. It says, in kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. I like that. It's one of the most important words in the Bible. Now, I want to flip through this real quick. Hebrews 6, 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the what? The elementary principles. The elementary principles. This is elementary. As those of you who know Chuck Elkins, it's the grade schools down the road. And you guys that graduated from Buffalo, Chuck, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> the pr- elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to what? He said, leave, listen, when we are, listen, when we get, when we get so old, I mean, if Les is still trying to learn his ABCs by a song, then we got a problem. (laughs) Or he's still taking a math quiz at the first grade math quiz. This is what it's saying. We got to move on. Look, not laying again, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of what? Repentance from dead works. He said, listen, this is an elementary principle. It's something that's a foundational thing. It's the foundation of repentance in our lives. We need to move on to perfection. There shouldn't be a debate about repentance. We need to live a repentive life. We need to have a life that actually saying, God, I'm embracing change. And I want you. I, I'm changing my mind. I'm changing direction in my life. 
It's part of my maturity. Amen. Repentance. I wrote this down. Repentance is the birth canal into the kingdom of God and the maturing in the kingdom of God. Not only does it birth us into the kingdom, it's the way we mature in the kingdom. It not only births me, I repent, right? We see all kinds of scriptures about that. Jesus said, those who are well have no need of physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. The first use of repentance in the Bible is actually about God. First word, first time it's used, actually the word repent is actually used God by explaining God or, or describing God in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. In the New Testament, in Matthew 3, we have John. He starts his ministry, and guess what his first words are? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus comes on the scene and picks up when John's thrown in prison. The Bible says that Jesus comes along, and he picks up this this message. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And believe in the gospel. Peter's message. We just read it in Acts 2.38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins. Paul, speaking to the intellectuals in Athens, said this. Truly, there are these, times, there are these times of ignorance God's over, God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. What does it mean to repent? What does the word repentance mean? It means a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. It's the reorientation of your mind and direction of your life away from sin and toward God. It's an about face. You hear something. You hear the word of the Lord. He he comes and he speaks to you. He speaks to me. We hear that and we follow that order and we turn an about face. Yes, sir. And we go into another direction. I like that. It's the radically turning away from anything which hinders our whole heart devotion to God. So the Holy Spirit's going to reveal things to you and I, to change us. And we are to repent, reorient our lives, and make the adjustments. I'm not going to get in condemnation. Conviction is about what I do. Condemnation is about who I am. Conviction, God shows up. He gives you a solution and a way out. Condemnation does not. It tells you how bad you are. You're unfit for use. Look at you, you scumbag. That's not the Holy Spirit. So when God shows up, he convicts. And with that conviction, right, there's a solution. Come out of this way. This is the way we're going. There's something we're trying to accomplish, son. There's something we're trying to accomplish, daughter. I'm, I'm, I'm making you whole. sanctifying you, making you holy. I'm making you whole. I want you to be whole. Why? Because he wants a pure reflection in the earth. God wants to work on us. That way we can reflect him and project him to the earth. Every human being, that's why anybody, listen, that's why you have sinners reflecting the glory of God. So how that be? When people, listen, I have saw people that are sinners feed the poor. I've saw people that are sinners do great things for people. Well, where'd that come from? Where'd that notion and unction come from? (laughs) It's just tarnished. And they'll turn it on themselves or they'll become selfish with it. That's all right. Because we're made in the image of God. And just because someone's not born again doesn't mean they're not made in the image of God. So every now and then you start seeing a flash of image. What that, that there was. Well, I saw that. Oh, that was an image. That was, that was a flash of the image. But what happens is, is that when we get born again, the spirit now moves on the inside of us, right? And his job, and he starts cleaning the mirrors off. That way we can reflect him. That way we can reflect him to the world. Because we're all mirrors. So, man, he's going to come start dealing with you about your language. Oh, yeah, he's going to come deal with you about your language. Yeah, he'll come deal with you. 
He'll come deal with you. Start about that anger problem you got. He start talking about that attitude you have, or how you're always this or that or the other. But when he comes, he don't show up to condemn you. He comes to lead you into a radical life change. He said, I've got a better way for you. But I got to embrace godly sorrow. And then that leads me to repentance. Repentance is a verb. It's something I do. I got to hurry. So the Holy Spirit is going to real, reveal things to us and cha to change. And we are to repent and make those adjustments in our life. I already said that. Now, confession like, it, 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 it's combined with repentance. Go hand in hand. So, so the, this is what you do. So all of a sudden now, sorrow hits your heart, right? You get convicted in your heart. You know what you got to do. And I know it's hard sometimes. And all of a sudden, you embrace that, right? And we're all in a process. I ain't perfect this. Nobody is, right? I'm still working. God's still working on me, right? And all of a sudden, he comes. And, and all of a sudden, man, he's, he calls and he convicts my heart. Shows me a blind spot. You ever had a blind spot before? You ever been driving before and all of a sudden that car was right there and you didn't know it was there? See, have you ever had about your life, you didn't see it in your life and all of a sudden it did, it showed it, God showed it to you? Man, it's happened to me so many times. So all of a sudden he shows that blind spot. What do I do with that now? I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to change my mind. But the first place you start is by confession. You know what you say, Father? It's not like, God. listen, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. It's not like that God just decides to forgive me at that moment. God has forgiven me past, present, and future forever. But what do I do? I, I appropriate that forgiveness that he already has for me. I reach up. I confess it. I want relationship with God. See, relationship, like, I'm, I'm, I want relationship with you. I want, I want relationship with God. So what's that called? It's called confession, right? I'm going to come to the light. John 3, that, 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 that when, you, when you want to do right, you step into the light. That way your deeds are known. If you don't like doing right, you step out of it and you go into darkness. Right? That's what John 3 says. That's the PIV. That's my version of it. It's somewhere like that. I mean, it's pretty close. But all of a sudden, this is so good because I'm getting this. It, it, what happens is, is God wants me to confess it. It's not for, confession's not for God. Confession's for me. My confession's not for God, it's for me. What it does, it brings me out in the open. It brings it out in the open. The, the enemy hides in the dark. All of a sudden, Father, I see that blind spot. Father, I feel that sorrow in my heart. I, I embrace that, and now I repent. I repent, God. I, I, I change. You've showed me. I'm changing my mind, and I'm going to change my direction. Father, I ask and thank, I thank you. I ask you to forgive me. I, I, I receive your forgiveness in my life. I thank you so much for that. And, Lord, I thank you for the blood that washed and cleansed me from that unforgiveness. Lord, I just confess that out man you talk about what's happening that's new wine starts to come that's new ground starts getting broken you start getting freedom in your life why because I'm just being honest with God repentance is important that's something we just walk every day but it takes a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit man so yeah so Oh my, there's a lot here. But let me say this. Repentance will bear fruit. The Bible says it. That, 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 that you'll bear fruit. Can I show you this one uh, real quick? And it's 805. Let's go to Hebrews 12 real quick. Hebrews 12. If you wouldn't mind to turn there with me. I want to show you this one. Hebrews chapter 12. Actually, let's read. I know I gave it to you at the ESV. Could you switch it over to the New King James? Because I just want to read it. From the Bible, from my Bible. I was going to read out ESV. It just had a few words I liked a little different, but I can break that out. Um, Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look here in verse 5. And you have forgotten the, have you forgotten the exhortation which speak to you as to sons? See that? As to what? As to what? Son. That word sons there is weos. That's mature. I'm speaking to you. I want you to be mature. My son... Do not despise the discipline of the Lord, the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he what? He disciplines. And, and scourges, or he disciplines, right? He dis every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, to what he says here, if you endure chastening, 
You endure discipline. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not correct? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. He said, if you're going to be in this family with me, you are going to get disciplined. And it's an act of his love that he disciplines me. It's not because he comes and he's a fun sponge or he's trying to take something away from me or he's, I can't believe that God, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, we're, no, I'm making excuses. He said, I'm coming to correct you. I'm coming to rebuke you. And it's good that I'm coming to do that for you because why? You're my son. If you weren't my son, I wouldn't correct you. You don't go and correct somebody else's son. You don't go correct somebody else's kid. You belong to him. He's your father. And he, remember now, he enjoys this process. He likes working with you. This discipline, it comes. Let's read on here now. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us. And we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our prophet, what's he saying? He said, listen, natural fathers, they're not perfect. And sometimes they discipline because they're frustrated. You ever discipline your kid because you're frustrated? (laughs) Because why? Listen, we do things. We correct and we discipline sometimes out of wrong motives. He said, I'm not like them. I am a perfect, I'm your father. I'm your perfect father. For indeed, for a few days, they chase and does seem best to them. But he for our profit, that we may par- be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chasing or discipline seems to be joyful for the present. <laughs> but painful. Nevertheless, Afterward, what's it do? It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been what? Trained by it. See, listen, if I am going to embrace change, I've got to embrace the training that comes with it. If I am going to embrace change, if I'm going to bring new, God's going to bring new wine out of me, I've got to learn to get this down. But I understand that when I feel that or sense that, I've got to embrace that. I've got to make this something like almost like it's a, a, a second nature in the sense. It's, it's muscle memory. And all of a sudden you go and you, and you embrace this sorrow. And now I know I'm going to repent. It's God discipline me. I'm going to repent. I'm going to do this quick. I'm going to be quick to repent. He said, if you embrace it, it starts to yield the fruits of righteousness. It starts, repentance leads to fruit. There is a change that happens. Which leads me to the final point. Sorrow, repentance, which leads to a life change. And he says this over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. He talks about this change that happened. And I want to read it out of the Message Bible up here. And now... Isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress, talking about what he done, he wrote to them and told them he needed to correct this guy, in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. See, if I'll live a repentant life, it produces a life change. Things start to change in my life. This is where we're trying to get to. New wine has to be put into new skins. How does all that happen? Sorrow, repentance. All of a sudden, if you brace it, his work in your life, it'll begin to change you, and it begins to produce fruits of righteousness. It begins to produce uh, fruits of repentance in your life. And all of a sudden, you're more alive, you're more concerned, you're more sensitive, you're more reverent, you're more human, you're more passionate, you're more responsible. All because of why? I embraced, they embraced that sorrow. They repented. And it produced a life change. You guys all right? So, repentance is how we experience freedom. Repentance is how we recover places the enemy has occupied. Places that need restored in our lives. Think about the prodigal son. Here he is, what's the Bible say? But when he came to himself... He went back to, he repented. 
And he ran back to his father. And inheritance was restored. If I'll just live a repent of life, just know and listen, I'm going to embrace the sorrow. When I feel God convicting me, I'm going to embrace it. Man, this stuff will change your life. It'll change, it'll change your life. Brace that sorrow. Brace that godly sorrow. God, thank you so much for that gift. Lord, today I repent. I metanoia. I change my mind and I change my direction. I don't just, I, I, I realign and I reorient myself with you and who you are. That's not you. That's not of you. That thing's not of you I repent and I get in line with you and father I thank you for this thank you for your forgiveness and all of a sudden it begins to clean out places in our lives and all of a sudden it begins to produce a life change isn't that good can I show you one more look at this one look at this one uh, Marianne put this one up there um, actually it's second Timothy I'll need to find it but I didn't give you I didn't write it down it just came to me uh, let's see here 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. 2, 24. Look at this. Because why? If I repent, it, 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 listen, I, I escape the snares of the devil. Check this out. And a servant of the Lord must not, be, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps him will grant them what? What's it say? Grants them repentance so that they may know the truth. Look what it says. And that they may come to their what? Senses and escape the snare of the devil having, take, having been taken captive by him to do his will. If I live a repentant life, I will escape the snares of the devil. That's good. Listen, if, if I repent, the Bible says repent and believe the good news. It causes me to believe. Jesus said that. He said, the king, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He said, believe the gospel. Believe this good news. If I'll repent, it actually will actually increase my faith to believe God. It'll start removing blockages out of my life. And I'll start walking in freedom. All because, why? I'm not, going, I'm, not, I'm not walking around like some kind of snail on the ground, like I'm just some unworthy. No, I'm saying, Father, I thank you that you're working in me. I'm a son. And I accept the discipline of your, of, of your, of, of your spirit in my life. I, I, I grab a hold of that. Thank you, Lord, for that conviction. And what a gift that God has given. We can't do this alone, Joe. We can't do it alone. You can't do it. I can't, I, I, uh, someone Google up this one. Uh, I can't remember where it's at. It's in Jeremiah. But it says, a leper can't change his spots. Put that. Google that somebody for me real quick. A leper can't change his spots. And I'll have, and then I'll have Mary in. You can relay that to me. Someone, someone's got it. I know it's going to come up on that Google. That Google just, I know. Anybody got it? Oh, there you go. Jeremiah 13, 23. Check this out. Yeah. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the, le or the leopard its spots? Then may you also do, do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Then may you also do good who are accustomed to evil. He's saying, listen, you can't do this without me. Just like a leopard can't change his spot, just like a, a, a black man can't change his skin color, he said, you know what? You can't change either. You need help. I cannot change without the Spirit. So this thing of godly sorrow is a gift. Embrace it. When I feel conviction, embrace it. And you know what will start to happen? New wine will start coming out of me. The Spirit of God will start to flow out of my life. And I'll walk in freedom. Amen? The process of change. The power of repentance. The power of a repentant life. Man, what a blessing it is. Amen. You guys stand up.